Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Georgetown Law Virtual Event. Um, my name is Matt Kalise. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Alumni Engagement here at the Law Center. So happy that you could join us this evening, especially uh, during the holiday season. You're in for an excellent session tonight about uh, Professor Chris Henning's book, The Rage of Innocence, How America Criminalizes Black Youth. I'm gonna introduce our speakers um, who will be on in a moment. Um, first, and uh, perhaps she'd like to turn on her camera now, I'd like to introduce Judith Brown Dianis, who will be our moderator for the evening. Judith has served as a lawyer, professor, and civil rights advocate in the movement for racial justice. She's been hailed as a voting rights expert and a pioneer in the movement to dismantle the school to prison pipeline. Uh, Judith leads the Advancement Project's national office work in combating structural racism in education, voting, policing, criminal justice, and immigration, a large portfolio. Since joining the Advancement Project during at its inception in 1999, Judith has worked with grassroots organizations to wage successful campaigns using litigation, advocacy, and communications. Judith also helped start Advancement Project's voter protection program during the election debacle in the Florida in Florida in uh, the year 2000, representing the NAACP. Over the ensuing two decades, the organization partnered with grassroots and national organizations to thwart voter suppression efforts like strict voter ID requirements, cuts to early voting, the closure of polling locations, and felony disenfranchisement. Judith has offered groundbreaking education reports, including opportunities suspended and derailed, the schoolhouse to jailhouse track, and detailed unnecessary work in related fields. Judith was awarded the Prime Movers Fellowship for Trailblazing Social Movement Leaders and was named one of the 30 Women to Watch by Essence Magazine. Judith, thank you so much for doing this this evening, and I'm really, really looking forward to seeing what you and Chris have to discuss. And by Chris, I mean Professor Henning. Um, Chris, my colleague, is the Bloom Professor of Law and Director of the Juvenile Justice Clinic and initiative at Georgetown Law, where she supervises law students and represents youth accused of delinquency in the DC Superior Court. Previously, she held the role of Associate Dean for Clinics and Experiential Education from 2017 to 2020. Chris, if you don't mind, has trained state actors across the country on the nature and scope of racial bias and how it operates in the juvenile and criminal legal systems, for example. Professor Henning has worked closely with the MacArthur Foundation's Juvenile Indigent Defense Action Network to develop a 41 volume juvenile training immersion program, JTIP, a national curriculum for juvenile defenders. She now co hosts with the National Juvenile Defender Center an annual week long JTIP Summer Academy for Defenders. I know that's something that we at the Law Center look forward to hosting every year. In 2019, she partnered with the NJDC to, to launch Racial Justice for Youth, a toolkit for defenders and in 2020 to launch Ambassadors for Racial Justice program, a year long program for defenders committed to challenging racial inequities in the juvenile legal system. Chris is an accomplished author with numerous articles, chapters and essays to her name, but this is her first full length solo book, which we're very excited to discuss tonight to hear her and Judith discuss tonight, The Rage of Innocence, How America Criminalizes Black, black Youth. It's about the disparities in policing practices, particularly as it pertains to black youth. I encourage you to read her bio after the event or during the event to learn more about her other scholarly works. She's won many, many awards. I, I, won't, I won't go into all of them here, but you can see them in her bio. Um, throughout the evening, um, feel free to use the chat box to uh, submit your questions. Um, and uh, really looking forward to a wonderful conversation this evening. Without further ado, please, Judith and Chris, thank you. Thank you, Matt. And um, welcome everyone. I am looking forward to this conversation this evening um, because this is work that is close to my heart. It is work that I've been doing for a long time and um, the book is incredible. Um, so, I, so I already want to just warn people that um, Chris, I'm, I'm, I might get just carried away with having this conversation um, because I'm excited about digging in. Um, but I hope that uh, you all will put some questions in that Q&A and that I will remember to ask for your questions as I get um, into this conversation. So um, let's dig right in, um, Professor. Um, and she told me I could 
call yes. <laughs> and that's what I'm going to do. And, um, so, even, and I just say thank you, really, truly, you know, when I was asked who would I want to be in conversation with, you were the very first name. You oh, are yes. definitely in the throes of this work, Judith. Thank I you. love what you do at the Advancement Project. So thank you for saying thank yes. <laughs> thank, um, you. thank you. Well, thank you. I'm excited. And so let's, let's dig in. You know, I, um, let's, I, I want to talk about like why. Yeah. Why this book? Why right now? You know, we 2020, we had uprisings across the country around policing. And, you know, you've been doing this work for a long time. So like, what was it about this time about kind of like your all of the work that you've done that has culminated in this book? Why and why now and put it in context to why it's important in this moment? Yes, and let me start by saying I have been representing children in the nation's capital for 26 years. And in that entire time, I have only represented four white children. That's it, four white children. That should just blow all of our minds, right? Um, it would lead some people to believe either that Washington DC has no white children or that white children do not commit crimes. And it's just simply not the case. Um, and it just, we, it's unconscionable that I, practice in in a city where I only represent African American youth. And so it's hard to do this work for a very long time without really wanting to blow up the system. You're not paying attention if you're not looking at and worried about and angry about the, the racial disparity or the racial makeup of the courthouse. And so um, I, over the years, have just been collecting stories in a file on my computer. The stories that really um, angered me or upset me um, of young people in the system. And I just knew that at some point I was going to write this book. And in 2017, I got invited to write a chapter um, of a book called Policing the Black Man um, being edited by Angela Davis. And I wrote those 25 pages and I was like, the world needs to hear more about this. And so it's gotta be, uh, it's gotta be a book. Um, and so um, really, you, you know, in the publishing world, you write, the book long before it actually gets re released, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, there it was no question that the book would come out at a time when we needed to be having this conversation mm -hmm. that I couldn't have predicted, Judith, what 2020 would look like, but mm -hmm. I certainly could tell you there was still gonna be outrage around the treatment of, of Black people and, and the treatment of Black children in particular. And so sure enough, the book comes out um, at, a, at a pivotal time um, in these conversations, right? After the killing of George Floyd, after, you know, you know a nine-year-old girl is pepper sprayed, um, you know, in New York, after Makia Bryant is killed, after Toledo, you know, mm -hmm. Adam is, you know, is, is killed. So the, the, the conversation um, was primed by what's happening in our country. And so, um, you know, I just think the timing is right um, and people uh, are interested in learning more. Um, and so I hope, um, and really one of my goals for this book was to give voice, truly to give voice to black children who have suffered from extraordinary trauma at the hands of police. And let me be real clear, when I talk about policing, I'm not just talking about police, traditional law enforcement in blue uniforms. I'm talking about all of us, all civilians who criminalize black children, right? Through irrational fears, unwarranted, you know, calls to the police, all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it turned out that the time was now, um, but the book has been brewing for a long time. So Chris, talk about, I, I, and just so folks know, we, we didn't prepare these questions. I'm just off, I'm off the top of my head there. Cause, <laughs> because I, when you say things, it's like, Okay, wait, I have a question here, I have a question there. Yeah. So, so tell, tell us a story 
about one of those that sticks out for you that paints the picture because folks need to understand like this is a this is a system of things that are happening this isn't about individual children who yes. you know because i think there is this theory that oh well black kids are are worse they act worse they're you know they're thugs they're 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 wild they're weak all of the stereotypes right like i know for me and the work that we do around the school to prison pipeline that there's a story that sticks out for me. Yeah. The story of a five-year-old girl oh. in Florida, who you probably remember, mm -hmm. who was arrested because she threw a temper tantrum after a jelly bean counting game. Isn't that amazing? I can hear her name was Jaisha. I can hear her screams yep. in my ears. In fact, one day I was playing a, a video, I was the video was on or something on uh, you know, and I think I had it on. And no, actually my daughter had it on. And I said to her, is that Jaisha? And I was in another room and she was like, how do you know? And I said, because those screams have stayed with me. Yes. So tell us, what is that story for you? Wow, I gotta tell you, Judith, there are so many stories, which is exactly why this book gets written. So let me say this, because really to, to, to underscore your point, I absolutely remember uh, that story. And uh, I mean, it's just, it's just tragic. We should all be angered by that. So I'm looking for stories that should outrage all of us. And so here's the thing, right? Um, I'm going to tell you the opening story of the book, um, and that is the story of my client, Eric. Eric was a 13-year-old boy who, on a Saturday night, is watching a movie, and he sees someone making a Molotov cocktail, right? In his 13-year-old brain, he says, hey, I want to make something that looks like that. He doesn't research it on the internet, right? He's 13. Mm -hmm. He jumps up, he runs to his kitchen and he grabs liquids, whatever liquids, liquids he can find. He also grabs a glass bottle and he begins to pour the liquids in, bleach, pine spall. Um, these are liquids that are not gonna catch on fire in combination. Mm -hmm. And my favorite part of the story is he takes a piece of toilet paper, right? And he runs the toilet paper from the inside of the bottle to the out and he closes the cap. We know this toilet paper is not gonna serve as a wick. It's gonna burn out before mm -hmm. it reaches the cap. And so he's 13, he plays with it for a second. He then forgets all about it. He puts it in his, in his book bag, right? He tells me he puts it in his book bag so it doesn't spill out on his mother's white carpet, all right? Mm -hmm. Puts it in his book bag, forgets all about it. His mother drives him to school on Monday, two days later, and he puts his book bag through the metal detector and the security guard, the school resource officer says to him, what is this? He immediately says, oh, that's nothing you can throw it away, all right? Little does he know that's the beginning of a huge ordeal. He's gone on to class, police officers show up, fire department shows up, he gets charged and arrested with attempted arson, with a bottle of liquids that will not blow up. And so here's what's super, that in and of itself, full stop should be outrageous. It's a kid being a kid, being creative. But here to add insult to injury, some time after that I'm representing uh, Eric, I'm giving a conference, I'm, I'm at a conference um, in Connecticut and I tell Eric's story and a white woman comes up to me afterwards and she said, my son did the same thing. And I asked her what happened to him. And she said, the school put her son in accelerated or advanced chemistry classes right? Mm -hmm. That's the contrast, mm -hmm. right? So this is what I'm talking about. It's the criminalization of normal adolescent behaviors. It's a mm -hmm. radically different response to Black children as opposed to white children. And so the book is just full of stories like that woven together with the data and with the research, and then also woven together with some of the high profile stories that should outrage us all like Tamir Rice. Um, mm -hmm. And even, you know, the killer of Mike Brown. Um, and, and people say, well, people even told me, oh, well, Mike Brown is adult. Why did you include him? Mike Brown was not an adult. <laughs> he was an 18 year old. Okay. Any of you out there who have kids, he is 
is every bit of an adolescent. Um, his brain is still forming in every sense of the word. So those are some stories. There, there are stories there. So, um, so you, I mean, as a as a public defender, you saw black children being pushed through that system every day, <laughs> and fighting it every day. So, like, were there aha moments for you that were like? this is bigger than this one, you know, because sometimes people say when you're in legal services and, and, you know, you're a public defender, it's just like you're churning, churning, churning. And sometimes people don't get a chance to see like, wait a second, <laughs> this, is a, this is a whole system that's working here. It's not just, you know, because I'm seeing all these people, but now I've got to think about the big picture and think about what the, what the impactful kind of system, systemic changes are that need to happen? Were there like, was there an aha moment for you? Um, there are multiple aha moments. I would say Eric is one, just because I was just outraged that you would charge him even before I heard about the, the white son who was able to, that was an aha moment. But here, I'm gonna tell you this, your question is so spot on because so many stakeholders in the system, and I include defense attorneys who are appointed to stand guard between children and the state and watching over the years how um, defenders even become complicit in a system because exactly as you said, when you're hired or you're appointed to play a role, you that's the role you play and you don't mm -hmm. look at systems. So everything, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? So even as a defense attorney, I go in and I'm focused on winning that one case for that one kid, right? Um, making the best argument that I can. But, and particularly I'll tell you what's fascinating about practicing in Washington, DC. So Washington, DC used to be called the chocolate city. And so, right, you know, there's black leaders and you think of, you know, sort of the black power of the city of Washington, DC. But if you look at the numbers, right, I'm talking about black children make up like 99% of the children in juvenile court. You know, we don't even have that many Latin, Latinx or Latino and Latina right. children in the system. And so looking, so one day, here's, here's an aha moment. You look at the statistics and the statistics show that black children only make up like 55% of, of, of the city, of the school age, right? Which is still really, really high for all over mm -hmm. the country, but it's not 99%. Right. So, but you practice for 26 years and you only see black kids. And then you realize that the data just doesn't support that. That's an aha moment um, mm -hmm. uh, for me. Um, you know, I think it's a, it's a really good uh, question. Um, I think uh, I'm trying to, you know, so Matt talked about how we've started the Ambassadors for Racial Justice program and some of these other initiatives. They came from aha moments. And I'll tell you another aha moment was doing trainings for defense attorneys across the country and listening to some of the language that was being used to talk about the kids that we represent gave us pause. Like, like what? wait a minute. <laughs> like, oh, like, I mean, look, I'm going to give you like talking about in our jurisdiction in, in DC Superior Court, people talk about moving bodies in the courtroom, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so this isn't even like defenders, but having an aha moment where I'm standing in court and someone says, um, you know, Mr. Marshall, have you moved the bodies from the mm -hmm. cell block to the court holding cell? And you're like bodies, these are human beings. So dehuman language that honestly, Judith, I'll admit to you, I've been practicing in DC for years and it wasn't until I became intentional about thinking about race that everything wakes up. Mm -hmm. And you're like mm -hmm. bodies, um, even the word juvenile, People use the word, oh my I hate that God, word. <laughs> I hate that word. Oh my God, Judith, you have no idea. But like literally, I tell people all across the country, I'm on a mission to Get eliminate rid of it. that word because we did mm -hmm. some research. There is no other context in which the word juvenile is used except for negative context. That's so right. like juvenile diabetes, a disease, juvenile right. male, like a horse. And then mm -hmm. you've got the juvenile delinquency system. So when I talk to police officers, I say to them, you they write police reports talking about I I saw two juveniles on the corner, two juveniles on the corner, you would never say to your spouse, hey, honey, we're going to go out to dinner as soon as the juveniles get off the phone. <laughs> you don't talk like that. So and right, it, it right. really has, it's not just language. That language is important. It's I mean, people, 
language matters. <laughs> I remember my daughter had a um, situation in school. Well, we were, I was at a, um, oh, I know. It was like opening orientation for when she moved into middle school. Mm. And one of the teachers, this is years ago, because she's 19 now. But when one of the teachers who was like her third grade teacher was like, oh, how are you doing? And he asked her, so how's, you know, how's it going? And and she said, oh, well, I'm in, you know, I just moved into middle school. And he said, oh, you're in gen pop now. Oh, God. It's a public school. And you're talking about children as gen pop, as in the general population of a prison, right? And I'm like thinking to myself, Oh, we're talking about black children as gen pop. Yes. Well, you know, that's so fascinating. You know, there's research. So what I loved about writing this book was I got to marry all of my anecdotal stories with mm-hmm. the research. There is actually research that talks about um, that. It's uh, qualitative research where they um, interviewed teachers, parents, and students. Um, And I want to say it was at a Midwest school. They kept the school uh, name confidential in the study. And they asked them to describe school discipline and school day-to-day encounters. And the language that they used was specifically tied to the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. We're like, where in the world? You know, they were like, I got a charge. You know, I got probation. Oh, you're in school. How are you getting- Offenses and lockdowns. Yes. It's so sad. It, and really, you know, the language, you know, the, the language piece is important because it serves to dehumanize, mm-hmm. right? It allows, it, it relieves sort of your, your psychological empathy and commitment to young people, right? Mm-hmm. It allows you to see them as other by mm-hmm. using language like this. And so um, language- Gems, you, 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 you know, as, they, as the young people say, you're spitting some gems. <laughs> So I, so I want to ask you this. So let's, I want to talk some about police and schools, right? Because as you know, like at Advanced Project, we have, we are the, we are the conveners, co-conveners of a whole movement um, for yeah. police free schools. You can yes. follow the hashtag police free schools. We have a website we came to learn and one called policefreeschools.org. And so let's talk about police and schools because some of like for Black youth, they they meet kind of like police on the streets, but then there's this whole thing around criminalization in the school building. Yeah. And there's a problem, there's like this, we have this issue around like people kind of want police in schools for safety, right? We have these school shootings, like a Columbine that happens, um, which was a predominantly white school, right? The effect of it was that black schools got over police, right? So talk some about like, what does it mean to have police in a school environment, good, bad, and ugly about kind of like that? And what does it do to young people, um, especially young black people in particular? So it's just so much to say about that. So many threads that we could we could pull from that. Um, and, and let me just start with a historical note about police and schools because I think the history is really important to understand um, how uh, students receive and interpret um, police in schools. And so I will admit to you that I bought into the narrative that we started sending police officers to school after Columbine, after the mass shooting Columbine in 1999, because um, teachers and parents were afraid to send their their, their, their kids to school, um, afraid of mass shootings. And as we dig into the history, and I so love your, your report, we came to learn. Um, but as you dig into that history, we have to acknowledge and recognize that police were sent to schools um, as early as 1939, when there were the first conversations about the potential for integration. And then school resource officers increase exponentially in the civil rights era um, under the guise of facilitating safe passage um, after Brown versus Board of Education. And um, But we know um, from iconic photographs and from the historical record that police officers ultimately, in many instances, impeded those integration efforts. And then, right, 
um, we have a, an increase yet again in police in schools in the 1990s, right? When mm -hmm. the federal government began to fund or added dollars to the, the cops in schools initiative. Um, and so look, we have to really understand the racial thread from beginning to end, because in the 1990s, what was happening? We had that temporary uptick in crime and the onset of the super predator myth, right? Mm -hmm. This pseudo scientific prediction that black children were gonna run amok and rape, kill and maim uh, the rest of the country. And so indeed, what's really important is, and I didn't realize this, that the National Association of School Resource Officers was founded in 1991. That was like eight years before Columbine, right? And so yeah. this myth or this notion, this narrative that we feed, uh, that we fed on that school resource officers or police officers in schools were a response to Columbine isn't quite accurate, right? It started much earlier than that. Moreover, um, just as you just said, Judith, after the, or as the federal government has continued to fund police and schools, where do the police go? They go to schools that have a predominantly African American and, and uh, uh, Latino presence, right? Or at least disproportionately so. And so that's really critical to understand. So then what does it look like for a child um, to walk into school? It looks like a child entering a detention facility. It looks like a child entering, you know, a war zone. <laughs> really, mm -hmm. uh, when I go visit my child, I say this, you know, I talk about this in the book, when I go visit my children, my clients, I should say at school, it's really not much different than me walking into the local detention facility facility, you know, in terms of taking off your shoes, going through the metal detector, you know, watching the banter between the school resource officers at the front door and the kids, um, all of that being searched and having to empty their pockets, all of that has a psychological impact on a child. And I often talk about this, this, this notion of police and schools being a, an extension of what children experience, black and brown children experience in their communities. That's so there's right. no safe space for them. There's right. no we, safe we say space. that it's it, the police are the same police on the streets or in the school building, the same police. It's the same police. Mm -hmm. And even if it, you know, even if they don't know them by name, they certainly, you know, they recognize them, you know. Take a new name on them, school resource officer, the same police. <laughs> it's the same thing. And, you know, so it undermines, and I know you, you know, your work, you all talk about, you know, school climate, it undermines school climate. It was so interesting. I read a report recently, it's after the book uh, got published, as people, as students return to school after the pandemic, mm -hmm. there were reports of teacher, of not teacher, parents and students saying how nervous they were to return to school, how, how afraid, how they saw the pandemic almost as a reprieve from the hyper surveillance and over criminalization or the criminalization of their children in right. schools. Right. And so it was almost but, like- So Chris, but talk some about the, so, yeah. There's the poli police and schools and there's kind of like this sense of how it, the, the climate and feeling mm -hmm. like we're walking into detention, but the role that actually like, what are they doing in the school building when there's black children around versus what they're doing in school building when it's all white children around? A absolutely. So several things. One, it is the, the, the ways in which police are called upon to engage in routine discipline of adolescent behavior, those behaviors that teachers and school administrators previously handled on their own. And so what you see is, of course, more police in schools means more arrest in schools. More arrest in schools means more arrest of black and brown students in school and at younger ages for normal adolescent behaviors. And I just can't mm, stress this. That's enough. important. Mm -hmm. Yes, normal adolescent behaviors, things that every one of us did when we were kids, things that our children are do, doing, 
things like talking back to teachers. I don't want that. I'm not condoning that. But our response for a white child is radically different than our response to a black child. Black children in school are criminalized from everything from the, the, the way they wear their hair, the clothes that they wear um, uh, to school, the music that they listen to, the friends that they hang out with are called gangs instead of friendship circles like everyone mm -hmm. else has. Um, they're, uh, you know, criminalized for, um, you know, experimenting in ways that kids do, like experimenting with drugs, experimenting mm -hmm. with sex. I, again, I do not, you know, I'm not condoning, you know, any kind of, mm -hmm. you know, criminal behavior, but you know, the research shows that we actually do more harm um, by employing traditional law enforcement responses to those normal adolescent behaviors. And they're for things, I gotta tell you, we would never send uh, a black child, a white child to, to court for. Just to give you an example, you say, what does it look like? Um, I, in the chapter I have on cops in schools, I open that chapter. Here you talk about an aha moment, mm -hmm. one of the most outrageous cases that I've ever uh, been a part of in my career was a young girl, 17 year old, was at school. She gets into an argument with her boyfriend. She grabs his cell phone and begins to walk away. As she's walking away, she's scrolling through the cell phone to see who he had been texting with because she thought in her teenage mind that he was cheating on her with some other girl. So what mm -hmm. happens? School resource officer sees this. This is in the hallway between classes, sees this and uh, arrest her. Right. And and she gets charged, charged mm -hmm. with robbery. Robbery is a felony, you know, serious violent crime. So right. it makes it seem like this this girl has this, you know, violent criminal predilection when in right. fact she was just being a teenager doing what emotional teenagers do in those moments. So there's so many examples like right. that. Right. Another thing, and I know you all talk about this a lot at the Advancement Project, it's the criminalization of disabilities. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so young kids who have cognitive uh, impairments, who have uh, autism. Um, and mm -hmm. if we know anything about autistic and, um, you know, kids with speech and language disorders is that um, they have difficulty. One, uh, following instructions. They have difficulty with the WH questions, who, what, where, when. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they are um, have sensory overload, you know, react to loud noises and loud sounds. So I could go on and on. They kirk out, I like to say, <laughs> um, and they get arrested and they get perceived as and treated as a threat. So I'm gonna go, I'm not gonna monopolize the whole time. I will go to a question because <laughs> I could go on and on. Um, and so, and actually this feels like a question that fits here, right? Um, John, Behan, if I'm pronouncing his name right, who is a, a graduate alum, uh, 67, the class of 67, yeah, I know that. Um, asked, um, how political is the issue at hand? It is, it is very political. Um, I think we, we know that. I mean, it's become everything from critical race theory to policing. It's, you know, so polarized around political um, uh you know, putting your stake in the ground, which really impedes our efforts to reach common ground. Because I think, you know, ultimately, if we would um, really sit down together and talk, we would agree that we all want a more nuanced approach to policing, right? Police officers don't want to be involved in the routine discipline of teenagers, right? Um, but we can't seem to get there because police officers feel under attack. Um, uh, and so they sometimes don't want to listen and don't want to hear it. So I do think the, the question has become uh, political. And I, I just, I, I, it worries me, or it's much uh, a stronger word than worries. Um, it pains me to see children um, the, as the, the collateral consequence of this, you know, sort of very politicized, politicized discourse Mm -hmm. um, around how to respond to normal adolescent behaviors when the research tells us how to respond. Right. And it feels like there's a politicization around, I mean, it's around race, 
there's one around violence. There's yeah. one around like who commits violence, right? Yeah. If we think about like the the rise in the number of police in schools in particular, right? We see the the crime bill, right? Because I always right. think about this. How what happens with young people is mirroring and coming right behind what we have done in our criminal justice or criminal legal policies, right? right? So three strikes, you're out, zero right. tolerance, all comes from what we've done in with prison populations. Yes. And then we force it onto young people and yes. into, into our schools, right? And so there's this way in which we have taken the, you know, police and schools in particular, for example, are like the, like, Politicians love it because it makes it makes everybody feel safe. A school shooting happens, let's get more police in schools, exactly. right? You feel safe in the moment. Yeah. Right? And then nobody looks at what the heck those police are doing when they're in schools when it comes Absolutely. to school. I that that is so right. That's so right. And, and and it reminds me, let's even step back, you know, further. You talked about the crime bill that just sort of jumped out at me, like in the 90s, right? politicians realized that they could make significant gains, could attract voters by manipulating race and crime. And right. so this super predator myth served them so well, right? right? And black children became the primary target in the political war. Um, mm -hmm. And so we've seen that time and time again, and you're absolutely right. So this notion of, you know, the increase of funding for police in schools was precisely on the heels of and as a part of this mm -hmm. sort of political capital that that folks had found around the intersection of, of race and crime yeah. when in reality you know the police free schools movement which now you know is sort of the the political debate of the air is actually not as radical i say this all the time to people it's not as radical as it sounds right mm -hmm. and nobody is saying that police officers cannot be called to handle a true emergency what mm -hmm. we're simply saying is we need to reimagine policing and use police only in those areas in which they're uniquely trained and for which we need them and for which there are no safe and healthy alternatives. Mm -hmm. And we need to relieve police officers of all those tasks and responsibilities that we've given them that they were never trained to do, like dealing with you know, children with um, you know, educational disabilities or cognitive disabilities, um, routine discipline in schools, all of those things, you know, they were never trained to do. And so why are we calling them for that? So, Kristen, I want to get a little bit at the at the heart of this. Let's yeah. just get into this a little bit of like the uncomfortable yeah. conversation that needs to happen. So you have there's a, there was something when I was reading this book, there was some there was one thing in particular that stuck with me. I can't like get out of my head right now. <laughs> you have um, this statement that says black youth are dehumanized. I tweeted this. I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> are dehumanized, <laughs> exploited, and even killed to establish the boundaries of whiteness yeah. before they reach adulthood and assert their rights and independence. Yes. That is about the root cause of this issue. Yes. So talk some about that. I, I just need you to unpack that statement. Yeah. So this was something that really was resonating with me as I was writing and pulling together the stories. And I'm going to tell you, this also starts with something I did not know, which was the, the notion of adolescence as a privileged, as a privileged social construct right? Mm -hmm. This blew my mind, right? So that before, I did not realize that before the Industrial Revolution, we thought about development in two stages, in um, childhood and adulthood. And it wasn't until the Industrial Revolution that we began to pull children in from the field and from agricultural, you know, uh, uh, farming, right? And we realized that in order to prepare children for the skilled labor, um, that we needed to have extended periods of education um, uh, to, and really this, who do you think benefited from this, this industrial revolution and this extended opportunities for education? It was white middle-class parents who could afford to bring their kids in, right? And we see the, um, the growth in colleges, we see the growth in professional schools, right? And so now as a result, 
we have this newly created period of adolescence. And when you do a Google word search about the evolution of words, the word adolescence doesn't really take root in the American uh, language until mm -hmm. the 50s and the 60s. I just did not realize that. I mean, the word was introduced mm -hmm. a little earlier, but it doesn't take root. So now we have this privilege this privilege of adolescence, which allows for a, an extended period of protection, of safety, um, social uh, recreation, adventure, experimentation, all of these opportunities of adolescence, but they are designed from the outset for wealthy white children or at least for middle-class children. Mm -hmm. And so um, black children are excluded in some very obvious ways from you know, e economic ways. But then as we then have mandatory school attendance and we have new labor laws and mm -hmm. all the children, black, white, all colors, you know, all races are brought in um, uh, from the field for this period of adolescence. There are other ways in which black children are excluded from the privilege. And so that's what I'm getting at, right? So um, at a time when um, we expect and we give black, oh wait, excuse me, we give children the opportunity to grow and test limits, um, uh, do you know sensation seeking, be impulsive. We show them grace and tolerance mm -hmm. and redirection. But yet for uh, black children, we don't allow for any of those graces. And so I say in some very quite intentional ways, Judith, um, America has a long history of denying children, black children, the right and the opportunity to be children from the days of slavery when they were treated as the, the property of their master to the mm -hmm. civil rights era when a teenager like Emmett Till can be sacrificed, right? Can be mm -hmm. lynched brutally to make a public statement, really symbolically um, to the world that we will not tolerate integration. And like I say, to set limits on the boundaries of what uh, a, a black child is allowed to become, mm -hmm. allowed to envision, uh, um, allowed to dream. Um, and so that just continues through history in very intentional ways. And I say that after the, these seasons, these periods of intentional limiting of black adolescence, the fears of black children become embedded in, this, in, the, in the American psyche, right? Mm -hmm. So in order to justify the lynching of, uh, of Emmett Till, you have to paint him as a monster, right? You have to right. paint him as a threat to America and to white America in particular, right? Mm -hmm. And so these narratives, and then I said in the 90s, um, you have to paint the picture of black children as being dangerous in mm -hmm. order to get your political gains. And so from season to season, we are uh, painting this picture of fear of, of black children. And so today, even folks who are committed to racial equity walk through a park, right? And they see a black child and they're afraid, right? That is from this history of, of painting black children um, as, 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 as dangerous and threatening um, in order to limit them um, and limit their opportunity um, and to preserve the privilege of whiteness. And so, I, it's a long way to get there. Ooh, that's what yeah. that's about. <laughs> well, as some people say, speak a word, speak a word. <laughs> um, so um, I'm going to ask you. So there's um, so there are a few alum who've asked um, Wanda Barklin and Adelina Reyes uh, Gavilan who asked. Uh, so what are your recommendations for change? Yeah, so so um, I think it, it's worth looking at them in several different buckets just to make it simple. You know, one, the biggest bucket, and this is the hard stuff, you talk about hard questions, the getting uncomfortable is the cultural shift, right? Mm -hmm. So I just said that all of us, even those of us who believe in racial equity, still walk around afraid of Black children. So we have to name that, right? Mm -hmm. We have to learn how to see Black children as children and to treat Black children as children. And that's all of us. So that we're not picking up the phone and calling 911 because we think you know a black child is about to break into our car or whatever it is. What is that irrational fear about? So getting proximate with young black 
children so that you could see them for who they're all. That's a cultural shift. That is bigger, right? Once we get there, we won't need a book like mine, right? Um, <laughs> but so the other things though, so if I, you know, until we get this cultural shift in the perceptions we have about black children, there are some structural things that we can do tinkering around the edges as, as it were. So one of the things I say is we have to radically reduce the footprint of police officers in the lives of all children and especially black and brown children who've been so disproportionately targeted, right? And so that you know shows up in a number of ways. One, the police free schools movement that we've talked about. It's also, um, radically uh, reducing the, the opportunity for um, police officers to engage with children in the streets, in the community, right? There are generations of Black children who have grown up under the constant surveillance of police officers in their neighborhood, being asked, you know, where they're going, where they're coming from, being asked to lift their shirts so that the officer can see whether they're carrying a weapon in their waistband. Most of us take it for granted that we can walk about our neighborhoods and not mm -hmm. um, you know, encounter these sort of moments with the police, but black children do not live with that luxury in so many pockets of the country. So we have to figure out how to reduce that stop and frisk we have to eliminate what they call consent searches. So for folks who are listening who don't know what that is, that's when an officer walks up and says, hi, can I search you? The officers will testify on the stand in court and say, I had no reason, no reasonable, specific, articulable reason to believe that they were um, engaged in some criminal conduct, but they voluntarily agree, voluntarily agreed to be searched. No child <laughs> in America has the psychological strength and wherewithal to make a decision about whether or not- To say no to a police officer. Exactly, are you what? kidding me? I'm scared to say no to a police officer. <laughs> and then you add race to that, right? So you've got children who are socialized to comply with adults. Right. And then you add race to that. Every black child in America who watched George Floyd get killed or Tamir Rice get killed right. or saw one of their friends get hurt is is going to believe they have no choice but to say yes. So we have to eliminate things like consent searches. And then, you know, after we've radically reduced the, the contact in those few circumstances where it is appropriate for police to be in contact with, um, with children, what we have to do is, is to you know, adopt a series of comprehensive regulations <laughs> that ensure that policing is developmentally appropriate, right? So that means training in adolescent development, training in de-escalation techniques. What do I mean by that? Meaning that you have to teach officers to remember that they're the adults and the adults have to be adults, right? And so when a kid curses at you or you know, is disrespectful to you, you can't mirror that back, right? Yeah. But you have to learn to de-escalate that impulsivity. Um, we have to have regulations on use of force. First of all, recently, you know, what, a year and a half ago now, maybe uh, two years ago, we had to pass regulations saying that police officers can't handcuff children 12 and under. Um, except for under extreme circumstances, why did we have to regulate that, right? <laughs> um, but we did. And so we have to regulate use of force, prohibiting tasers. Yes, they tase little black children, <laughs> pepper spray black children, you know, sick dogs on black children, um, like we did in the civil rights era, right? That stuff is still happening today. So we have to have a series of, of, of regulations that, that reduce that. And then I think the final sort of bucket, there's so many other buckets, but another bucket that I think is worth saying is this notion of this the, the dehumanization. So when children do make mistakes and when they do commit serious crimes, we have to treat black children in the same way we would treat white children, which is employing the best practices, the evidence-based best practices to deal with violent crime among adolescents, right? So it's not sending a child to Rikers Island uh, for three years to await trial as an adult right, in solitary confinement, like Khalif Browder, who then commits suicide. That's not what we would ever do to a white child, right? Uh, nobody would tolerate that. Um, and so we have to have um, the same sort of rehabilitative um, mental health responses, public health responses, even to violent offenders um, for Black children as well as we do for... for, you know, for so, so you, I mean, you... 
you talk some about this like consent thing because I just want to get at this yeah. issue, Chris, yeah. about yeah. the consent. Um, and there's one part of that is that you're too young to actually consent, right? You're a child. How are you really going to consent? The other part is that sometimes, sometimes people think like, well, what's the big deal? Yeah. If you have nothing to hide, no. what is the big deal? Talk some about that. Absolutely. I so love that question because folks do need to know this. Um, there is a psychological cost, right, um, to Black children and there is a cost to us in terms of public safety. We're actually doing ourselves no favors um, by stopping children illegally. So actually, I should really break it down even more. There are a number of costs. There's the cost to fundamental privacy, which we as a country have said we are committed to. There is a cost to principles of racial equity. If we treat Black children differently than white children, that's a cost to our values in society, right? But then there is the cost to the psychological health and well-being of, of Black children, and there's a cost to public safety. So let me break down that the, the, the psychological cost to Black children. There is a growing body of research documenting the extraordinary psychological trauma um, that Black and Brown children experience in uh, at, at the hands of police. Um, research shows that children who have who live in heavily surveilled neighborhoods and who have been the target of frequent stops and frisk have high rates of fear, anxiety, depression, hopelessness. They become hypervigilant, meaning that they're always on guard and distrusting police officers. Mm -hmm. And the research shows that that distrust of police officers transfers to other adult authority figures, including mm -hmm. teachers, right? They become, you know, children become um, angry, um, detached, um, unable to learn in school. Um, and what's so powerful about that research is that it shows that trauma occurs even when the child is not the direct target, him or herself. But just um, having, just hearing about um, or, or witnessing police violence or even just police encounters, regular everyday encounters um, among their family members, among their friends, other people that they're close to is just as traumatic as experiencing it themselves. And so what, the, what we learn is that just having to worry about being the next target of some police act is in and of itself a, a source of trauma. There's research showing that children who live in heavily surveilled police neighborhoods have very uh, uh, poor sleep quality, um, they suffer from insomnia, um, they have uh, the, the police, negative encounters with police really compromises and um, undermines healthy adolescent identity development which is the most important thing that happens in our adolescent years. So degrading and dehumanizing encounters with the police cause young people to question who they are, who they can become, and how they are situated in relationship to other people in society. Also, and this really goes to the point about how we're not doing ourselves any favor on the public safety front, because the research shows that at adolescents, that um, our views about law and law enforcement become fixed in our minds mm -hmm. during our adolescent years, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you have negative early encounters with police, yeah, right. it's gonna have a profound right. impact upon how you engage with police later in life and whether you even think it's worth it to participate in mainstream society. So there've been uh, uh, several studies that talk about over-policing and hyper-surveillance among adolescents actually increases crime instead of reducing crime. So at the end of the day, the public isn't any safer, police aren't any safer, um, and children aren't any safer. So, mm. so another question from uh, an alum, Patrick Levine Rose, class of 89, asks, this is a good question. Um, what are the best and most successful examples of organizing? Um, to reach the city councils and mayors who can hire fire police chiefs and require policing to change? What are some roles lawyers can play to assist those grassroots and coalitions and political lobbying efforts? Um, 
Wow, I tell you, Patrick seems like a, a movement lawyer. Like exactly. <laughs> I was gonna, you know, I was going to say that. Um, I feel like y'all don't know who y'all talking to. You should ask Judith that question, right? That's exactly what this work is about. It's about the police free schools movement. And I, I mean, I really would love to hear um, Judith's answer to this, but let me just tell you one of my aha moments. You asked about what one profound moment in terms of organizing and effecting change. And that was back in. And I want to say it was in 2005, we had what we considered to be a pretty draconian piece of legislation that was being introduced in DC City Council. Um, and the, the legislation, among other things, would have been, uh, would have allowed for the public release of, of juvenile court records. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and would have made, you know, right now we as a country have decided that juvenile courts are designed to give kids a second chance. Right. And so one of the ways we do that is to, um, you know, what happens in your teenage years stays in your teenage years and the, your, your public, your records are not public. So um, one of the many pieces of, of, of that particular 2005 legislation would have, been, would have been to make the record public. And so we, as a community, got together. I mean, there were advocates would come together and meet at different locations. I remember at the time I was at the DC Public Defender Service and we would have meetings and we would have advocates from the, you know, uh, uh, lawyers who were in landlord tenant court. We had education lawyers, we had PDs, we had all advocates representing um, every aspect of sort of, you know, poverty law or, mm -hmm. you know, law and social justice around the table. And some of the grassroots organizers who weren't lawyers came to the room and said, you know what, we need the voices of children. And so we, um, it, you know, there was an oversight, but there was a, I'm sorry, not oversight, but there was a hearing on the bill. And so city council called for testimony and the grassroots organizers signed up and said, we're gonna bring some children to come testify. And can I just tell you, Judith, 300 children, 300 children showed up in city council. They had set those hearings for a half a day. Those hearings went on for two and a half days wow. because they let those kids come and testify. Mm -hmm. That was transformative. Shut the bill down. Right. It was an mm -hmm. omnibus juvenile justice bill. All of the major damaging provisions of that bill were uh, denied. Um, and when mm -hmm. we went in, we thought we were going uphill, but it was that. And so the question is, how do you organize? First of all, these issues affect young people. So getting young people at the table. So part of it is about educating yourselves. Right. Yeah. So educating yourselves by reading the reports, reading the advancement project reports on on these issues. Um, you know, I, I'm not even you know trying to sell a book. I'm saying really like reading, you you know, uh, books like this that lay it out, figuring out what the issues are. I know everybody can't do one thing, but can you pick one topic, right, mm -hmm. that you're passionate about and figure out who's doing the work? Is it advancement project? Is it your local ACLU? Is it a, a law school that you can partner with? But that's really important to figure out how you can get involved. Um, but more importantly, single most important is hearing for the, from the voices of the young people who are most impacted. Yeah. Um, and so I would say, you know, volunteering, you know, at, at you know, um, a local community center where you can hear from young people and offering to help them, you know, craft testimony. I love, um, we at Georgetown are involved in a number of uh, sort of youth groups, like, you know, working with young uh, girls, black girls, and helping them develop their own voice to, to give, you know, to, to speak to city council, mm -hmm. how do you do written testimony? You know, as lawyers, even if you don't have the legislative um, skill set, you can help young people yeah. write a letter to city council, um, find their voice. So that's that's yeah. what I would offer up. That's great. Yeah. I, so don't forget to put questions in the in the Q and A um, for for Chris. And I mean, I just wanted to add to that. I do think like one of the one of the things that has been like the best for me about doing work around school to prison pipeline and police free schools is working with youth. Yeah. Um, we support youth organizing groups across the country. One of my, you know, one of my favorites is um, Padre St. Jovenes Unidos in Denver. Um, and um, 
and they just changed the name to Movement Power. Um, but they are a youth group that really, um, when we first met them, they couldn't get a meeting with, the, with their school district to get data. They just wanted data because they knew something was happening to Latino children in Denver. And so we um, teamed up with them to do public records requests. Lawyers doing public records requests, right? Then once they got the data back, we helped them analyze the data. The young people came up with their demands of what they wanted that was going to be different. We took the state law and analyzed the state law for them, analyzed the discipline code. We helped them create, rewrite their school discipline code yes. that they then advocated for with their school board. That school discipline code passed. Three years later, we came back and they said, there's a problem with police in schools. And we sat down with young people and came up with demands around police in schools. And what we did was we wrote a memorandum of understanding to limit the role of police in schools. They got that passed through, this, through the school board. Next thing, that was three years. And then after that, five years later, they, the young people decided they wanted police out of schools altogether. And so they moved, for, they moved a campaign to get police removed from Denver Public Schools. Yeah. And so, that, you know, just being able to, lawyers being in this relationship, you have to be in relationship and in proximity yes. to people impacted by the problems. Because we sometimes think, oh, well, I know what's best. I mean, I'm a Black woman, but I'm not a Black student in a high school nearby. And so you have to listen to young people. And the problem a lot of times with these issues in particular, I think, Chris, is that we don't listen to young That's people. That's right. That's right? right. We think we know yeah. we're adults. Oh, we've been there. We've been young. We were young at one time. You're not young right now. Right. And so <laughs> I think being able to listen and then, like you said, train them up, yeah. provide them with the tools that they need. Yeah. And that's also kind of leadership development. That's too, right. right? So, you know, and I think people need to understand that these police and school stuff after George Floyd was murdered, um, we have about 30 some odd districts that have removed police from schools. And that was due to young people, Oakland, um, yeah. San Francisco, those are two places, Denver, um, where young people moved for this because they knew that they can't learn in an environment that doesn't love them. That's right. And that having police around them meant that they were not being loved because they don't trust the police. That's right. And you know what's so powerful about that is like you think about after Parkland, after some of these major school shootings, those mm -hmm. students spoke out. They said, yes, we want our schools to be safe, but we don't want police officers right. to make us safe. We don't need right. an armed guard to come in and make us safe. Right. So, you know, yeah. cause so you had mentioned something um, uh, earlier about it's not just the police. Yeah. So talk a little bit of what, what do you mean by that? <laughs> well, I, you know, look, I have a whole chapter on policing by proxy, mm -hmm. which, I mean, think about some of the most, you know, uh, significant cases that we've heard about um, over the last, I don't know, just, you know, 10 years alone, thinking about Trayvon Martin, thinking about um, uh, Jordan Davis, you know, who's killed for listening to loud music. Oh, what a tragic, you know, story. Think about Jeremiah Harvey. Y'all remember him? He was the nine-year-old boy who was in a bodega in Brooklyn, right? He walks into the bodega, his book bag um, brushes against a, a, a woman, right? A, a white woman who turns around and automatically assumes right? That he did it, that he touched her intentionally, and he touched her for sexual gratification, right? That is all about our deeply embedded psyche and fears about Black children, right? And so there's no way, you know, so she says, you know, the woman who uh, called the police, um, you know, says, you know, this isn't about race. It wasn't about race. It's every bit <laughs> mm -hmm. about race, right? Think about the legacy of the, uh, the legacy of, of, of the, the narrative underlying the lynching of Emmett Till. It was so that right. he the was- The Scottsboro Boys, right? The Scottsboro Boys. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. You know, it goes on and on. And so no, in that exact second, did she turn around and say, mm, Emmett Till is behind me? No, of course right. not, right? right. But 
but it's that latent, you know, psychology or the latent cognitive biases that live on from generation to generation that that um, guide the fears. And so that's the that's what I'm talking about, right? The way, and then also too, in this question about the the politi politicization of these issues, right? So then, how is it that a Trayvon Martin gets killed and people raise more money for his killer right, <laughs> than for right. the families, right? It's, it's, I mean, we just bought into the, the fears of black children. That is what, what I am talking about, how it happens historically, intentionally, and then how it continues um, as an implicit cognitive bias that we aren't aware of even when we mean well. Right, even when we ascribe to democratic principles of equality, we still live with these inherent biases. So, so, that's so what, what do we do about policing by proxy? I mean, it's one thing for us to go out and change the laws about police and regulations. And what do you do about police policing by proxy? Yeah, and it's a lot of that culture shift that we talk about. It's about getting in proximity. It's about owning it and not getting defensive when, when people say, when we have these conversations, like, don't be defensive, own up, let's talk about it. You know you've locked your car door, <laughs> right? <laughs> when you, you saw I'm like, you know that, okay. No. Uh, but it's it's that, I think that that's, and that's the harder work, right? It's it's that proximity work and, and we're not gonna get there until we, Tell narr I also talk about storytelling and narrative as being important. How many stories can we tell that help you, help the reader or help the, the listener see themselves, mm -hmm. right? You got to see themselves or see your own children um, in these stories. Now, I mean, I, and this is really controversial. I, I sort of sometimes don't even know where I come out on this because I'm a defense attorney and I don't want to, you know, uh, criminalize uh, more behavior, right? But there's got to be some accountability, right? For people who pick up the phone and call the police for on for on black children for normal adolescent behaviors mm -hmm. or something less than that. And so in that section of the of the book, I you know also talk about a series of stories where you know a woman calls the police because a child outside is selling water too loudly, mm -hmm. right? You know, mm -hmm. we had in the District of Columbia, um, kids got arrested on the National Mall, actually one of my clients, you know, on the National Mall for selling water, right? Or, you know, um, you know, people calling the police because uh, uh, they see a black child in the back seat of a car that's being driven by a white woman, by, by, by a white woman in the driver's seat and a white woman in the passenger seat, right? Mm -hmm. And so they call the police because the assumption is that they are being robbed. <laughs> and it turns out that the, the white woman who was driving the car was the grandmother of the black child. But what mm -hmm. do they do? They pull the car over, they immediately order the black child out on the ground, put him on the ground when mm -hmm. he comes up. Mm -hmm. And then they ask the woman, hey, by the way, are you okay? Who is this? And they're like, that's my grandson. It's stuff like that, that we, so, so the question then becomes, what do we do about that? We've got to figure out ways to hold people accountable for that. It makes people, you know, think twice about it. So there's been some legislation about it. Um, I, I, um, I, I don't love the word, the, the, um, the Karen Act, um, uh, yeah. because, you know, but, but, you know, that's, that's, that's what's happening. Right. This, the policing, there is a way in which um, America, and I'll be honestly dominant America, power holders within America try to police Black adolescents and limit Black adolescents. That goes back to that question you asked, dehumanizing, exploiting, arresting, uh, criminalizing Black children to um, maintain uh, the boundaries of whiteness and mm -hmm. privilege. And mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think, you know, that's, it's a hard question. What do you do? But mm -hmm. I, okay, the third thing I'll say about how to, what do we do about that? It's, it's about, um, one, I say educating self, it's about educating each other. And so I, I think in this moment, you asked about writing a book in this moment means that more and more people in their respective offices 
are willing to have these conversations, right? And so willing to come together, you know, um, all the different races coming together within an office to talk about these issues and to educate folks, right? So that we can begin to unpack why it is we're so afraid of black children and, and really helping uh, our, our, our colleagues are having some level of grace, right? People were raised this way. They didn't wake up one day and decide to be, they're gonna be hateful and afraid of black children. You know, we gotta have some grace. Um, and so we have to take the time um, to have these conversations across race and class um, and, and different communities and neighborhoods. Yeah. And I feel like it's the, it's the moment to have that conversation, yeah. right? Like it's, I mean, first of all, we're gonna be shut down in a pandemic. You have lots of Zoom conversations right about now. But, <laughs> but also, it, I mean, you know, 2020, the uprisings across the country after George Floyd was murdered and Breonna Taylor were murdered, um, people took to the streets and it wasn't just black people, right? It was, it was a multiracial, like, oh, yeah. tens of millions of people across the globe yes. who said enough. Right. And so, you know, so part of the issue is like, how do we, we said enough in the summer of 2020, how do we keep that going? Right. Mm -hmm. Like not retreat right. from that conversation about right. race. Right. right. But we knew that it was wrong, that there was something that we felt uncomfortable about and we were open to having a conversation. Yeah. And yeah. so the question is, how do we keep that conversation going and keep learning and leaning into what is for some people an uncomfortable conversation? but something, a conversation we have to have and not retreat to like, well, let's get rid of the whole discussion. Let's just end discussions around race in school, right? This CRT thing is crazy, right? Like that's not the way to go. That is not how we are gonna be able to deal with this. So I, I, I love this, this question. I don't know that I have received this from anyone else who, who I've spoken to. Um, you know what immediately jumped in my head when you, when you asked the question? One was building it into um, educational curriculum right mm -hmm. um in some way so so secondary education you know you know civics is all the the the, the rage right now um mm -hmm. but civics curricula in school often is about traditional methods of uh, democratic participation so mm -hmm. urging right. people to vote, vote urging right. people to do community service all of that but what if right we use that space um, to, to really build in these hard conversations. As I talk this out loud, I'm sort of thinking also, you know, as I speak, mm -hmm. then you're going to have that critical race theory fight <laughs> on your hands. Um, but it doesn't have to be, it's not about, you know, CRT. It's about, you know, social emotional learning. It's about mm -hmm. empathy. It's about building conflict resolution skills, right? Um, it's, a, it's about citizenship. Mm -hmm. in its truest sense of mm -hmm. the word. It's That's about right. democracy, um, but building that into the curriculum. And I think, you know, we started talking about these leadership skills, cultivating adolescent leadership skills around things, uh, around those critical issues um, that impact their lives, right? Mm -hmm. So adding that. So I, I think, you know, starting at a very young age is one. I also think um, you talk about the sustainability of a moment like this. I think, you know, sustainability of moments like this have a lot to do with funding. And so what are the um, funding incentives that can perpetuate this. So we have the conglomerate, <laughs> the massive conglomerate of police in schools because the federal government funneled money into that. Mm -hmm. First of all, what if we had funneled all that money into alternatives, right? Like mm -hmm. a public health approach to public safety instead of law enforcement. So I do wonder, you know, at, um, at times when I'm dreaming big, if we, you know, could have, we could still, right, shift that tide slowly shifting the tide of our funding, um, you can drive change with money, right? The federal right. government said to states, all of that money came in as incentivized funding. I'll give you billions of dollars for your school if you fill in the blank. And right. the fill in the blank then was um, develop police school liaisons and police school partnerships. How about we redirect that money um, right. there? So that is that is one um, one two ways I think that we might be able to sustain some of that momentum, but it's a mm -hmm. great question, I, you know. Yeah, I, you know, I've been saying lately that I feel like, especially after this pandemic, that we need to start a national care corps. Mm, yes. That is a, a national core of people who get trained up to be 
counselors and therapists and yes. healers, right? Because our children, I just read this article in Time Magazine. Um, it was just this week that talked about how 5 million children across the globe lost a, at least oh, one wow. parent of COVID. Yes. And 60 some odd percent of them are children of color. Wow. And so um, we're all going through a hard time, right? <laughs> I mean, adults are going through yeah. a hard time. So imagine what our children and young people yeah. are going through um, with so much death and sickness around them, right? And so we do need this kind of care core and also for our systems, right? Because this is the other thing, it's not just about fixing the kids, it's about right. fixing the adults too and go. the systems, right? And that those systems that, you know, in the juvenile justice system, which is all kinds of like those two words together, together. Anyway, um, you know, got away from the so-called rehabilitation model, yeah, right? Absolutely. And it's really a punishment model. Absolutely. So how do we do something different that gives young people the tools they need, the healing that they need um, to be able to deal with all the trauma, um, but also gives them back their, their youth? Right. And treat kids as kids and treat kids as kids. So let me, you know, I want to bounce off that with two things. So you talked about this National Care Corps. One of the things that I write about in the book um, was a phrase that a psychologist friend shared with me that has just stuck with me for life, which is that every child needs at least one irrationally caring adult. And mm -hmm. every child would thrive or do even better with a team of irrationally caring adults. Mm -hmm. And so your National Care Corps made me think about that because, you know, you know, we're the as parents, right? Parents are that irrationally caring adult for their children. Right. They know, we all know that teenagers are gonna make mistakes, right? They're gonna mm -hmm. do stupid, you know, dumb things mm -hmm. all the time, right? But mm -hmm. we still love them, we still forgive them, we still come to their aid, we still bail right. them out. We fight right? for them, right? We fight for them. I mean, that's just what, you know, that's yeah. what an irrationally caring adult does. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean that we don't redirect them, that we don't give them consequences, but right. it's not criminal them. It's not embarrassing them. It's not right. excluding them. And I think that's where, um, you know, the, 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 you know, the problem is absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and then you talked about the, the juvenile legal system. Um, and, and so I keep the word people ask, well, wait a minute, are we going to call it the youth legal system? So yeah, what would you call it? Because somebody did ask that in, in yes. juvenile, what you going to call it? <laughs> So, so here's the thing. So um, this is where I've landed, at least for right now, which is it's one thing I refuse to say justice system, right? Or, or, you right, know, right. We, so we call it criminal, it criminal legal system. We that's don't right. Criminal that's right. Criminal. So There's no justice so, in that system. There none, right? So the juvenile legal system really gives voice to how horrible the system is. But so right now, at least as this first layer effort of, of reform, when we got when we when I advocate for getting rid of the word juvenile. I mean in reference to individual children so that we would never say the word in reference to an individual child. So I, re I mean, it's hard to figure out what the word is, but youth, young, per let, me, let me back out. Let me be very clear. We should be talking about every single child by their name and by their first name, um, you know, not Mr. and Mrs. Like that's what happens in some jurisdictions. You go to court and they want to say Mr. and Mrs. And you're like, well, my client's first name is Zara. Right. <laughs> As Donnie. Monique Morris, is, Dr. Monique Morris talks about the adultification yeah. of Black children. Exactly, exactly, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it's so problematic, right? Um, uh, and we can't, we can't, um, and it does. We talked about this earlier. Language matters. It has an impact on the sympathy or the, the empathy and your ability to see that child as a child. So right. it is critically right. important. Um, it's worth, as we're talking about the adultification, not only Dr. Um, Monique Morris, but also Dr. Philip Atiba Goff. Yes, Goff, that's he, right. Oh my God, he's done some wonderful work. He and his mm -hmm. colleagues, you know, demonstrating empirically that Black children are already seen as what, four and a half or more years older than they actually are. All of that matters. So right. language matters too. So, so the question is, well, what do we say instead of juvenile? We don't say, Mr. Call them by their first names. And when we're talking about youth as a collective, talk about youth. 
teenagers, young people, children, mm -hmm. right? All of that. Um, it, so it, it's, we've got some work to do. Somebody asked the great question, Andrew. I so appreciate your question. We have been toying with this, um, right? Changing the name. <laughs> Changing the name. So the Juvenile Justice Clinic, we got to decide, we got to figure out what we're going to do. I will say our partner organization, we do a ton of work with the National Juvenile Defender Center, and they have just announced that they're going to change their name to the GALT Center. So this oh. is huge, right? And, and I was, you know, there was a, their national advisory board um, has been a part of figuring out what that new name would be and right. figuring out how to, I mean, that's after years and years of branding, um, mm -hmm. but it's so important. That's how important it is um, to make that shift. And so they're going to be called the Galt Center. So we've got to think about what we're going to do in that regard. So what's next with the with the book? Are you going on tour? What, tell us about so that. I actually have been on a tour. So I'm actually on leave, you know, all my Georgetown folks out there. So I've been on leave for this semester. The book came out September 28th, and I have been on a very massive tour um, that very much will continue into the new year. Um, I invite opportunities to speak if folks, you know, what, what is happening, which I think is fabulous. And this is really what you want with the book, right? You know, it's not writing a book for book saying. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it is about sparking conversation and change. And so having opportunities to get in front of state and local legislative bodies, legislators, oh yes. my goodness, mm -hmm. is, is really picked up. Um, having an opportunity. So I already before um, the writing of the book was doing trainings around um, racial justice, um, issues in the juvenile legal system, um, uh, uh, unconscious bias, um, mm -hmm. a, a range of issues around race, but that you know has increased radically, largely because of the, the since the, the you know the death of George Floyd. Just yeah. as you said, the murder of George Floyd. But just as you said, I mean there were thirty um, school districts, right, who made movement around mm -hmm. uh, the police free schools. That was, you know, a long work in progress. And I think what we're seeing is more folks being interested in engaging on these reforms and conversations. So getting invitations to speak in, in um, school spaces. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, Judith, you talked about loving working with youth. This was unexpected for me, but I have um, begun to, um, I've always had contact with youth groups, but having um, giving young people an opportunity to read this book and giving book talks with young people has been mind blowing. Mm. It has been, a, I mean, I just didn't expect it. They love it. I mean, the, you know, the young people, well, I bet. you're speaking my, you're, right. you're telling my story. You're telling their story. Yes. And so I knew that, but I, I don't know why I didn't expect, I mean, because you write a book, it's a trade press book. It's not meant to be an academic book, but mm -hmm. the first time I got invited, it was a boys and club, uh, it actually wasn't the first time, but maybe the second time, a boys and girls club in Ohio, right? Um, and they, um, the question was, could it be read by 10th graders? And I was like, hmm. In fact, it could be, um, right, right. and sure enough, and and actually, their group had even younger. They had middle school kids and teenagers, and they were reading oh, excerpts right. from the book and dialoguing around it. So I just I offer that right. you ask, you know, what's next right, um, right. is thinking about what a youth uh, leadership curriculum might be mm. around a book like this, which um, is important but, because I think it's it's that they're reading their own story, but also contextualizing it right, yes. so that they start to understand. Oh, it's it's not me. Right. Right. Yes. It's, it's a system. It's not me. Yes. I think that is that is very important. Huge. Like I thought, you know, like kids will say, I thought I was going crazy. I mean, it's just like, mm -hmm. you know, nobody believes me. I've been trying to tell people this and nobody, mm -hmm. you know, believes me, that kind of thing. You know, I was teaching a, a Zoom class at a high school in Florida. Um, you know, I love this. First of all, the class met at 7:45 a.m. I'm like, what? I'm sorry. You want me to come? <laughs> it might have even been and they were there. Yeah, they were there. Oh, every one of them. Oh, every one of them. And had read parts. I was like, what is happening? And had questions and, 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 and the like. And what was so fascinating about that class was it was a class on writing. So it was uh, the teacher was oh. teaching a class on, yes, on writing and, and writing around social justice issues. Mm -hmm. And so it was a fabulous conversation with the young people about this combination of storytelling of data collection and mm -hmm. of, of other empirical research. So I had an opportunity to talk to them, not only about the content of, of the book, but how do you gather data? Um, and how do you give voice um, to these issues so that you can affect change? So that was, the, you know, so you asked what's next. Um, that's been a surprise. And so I have to think about how to formalize that maybe mm -hmm. and, and, yeah. and move that forward, so. 
That would be great because youth groups could use could definitely use it and engage with it and use it in their campaigns, right? Right, exactly. So when they're doing work around juvenile justice issues. Well, this has been great. I, I mean, I don't know, I don't know about you people in the audience, but I, I'm, we had fun. Right? <laughs> great conversation and learned a lot. Right, so yeah. We can hand it back over to Matt. <laughs> Thank you again, Thank you. Judith. I so so I just I really Thank you for having I, me. I just so admire all that you do at Advancement Project. So thank you for taking the time. Thank to you. Today. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Judith. And thank you, Chris. Um, you know, we've we've learned a lot this evening. And uh, I like what all the things you're saying about momentum, right? Let's keep it going. And where can we spark conversation? And so I know for our alumni and friends and community members who are uh, on the audience tonight, um, you've given them something to, to go into 2022 with to spark. And so uh, thank you both for doing that. And Chris, looking forward to uh, seeing you out in the world on the rest of your book talks and, exactly. and to the Georgetown friends and, and community members out there. Thank you again for taking time on a weekday evening with the holidays upon us uh, to be with us for, for this time. And um, stay tuned uh, for more from Georgetown Law. And uh, if, if I don't see you all before then, happy holidays and uh, best wishes for the new year. Thank you all. Take care.